Hey guys, my name is Annie and welcome to my channel, 10 to Life, where I am bringing you full true crime cases in under 10 minutes. Full cases, start to finish, but only what you want to hear. None of the boring storylines or the empty plots, just the key facts, the most insane details, and all the unexpected stuff we know happens along the way. I'm coming to you directly from my apartment here in Brooklyn, New York, which if you're watching the video version of this on my YouTube channel, you can see beautiful New York behind me. And if you're listening to the podcast version of this, but you want to check out the video version, feel free to head over to my YouTube channel. If you guys like what you hear, please like, comment, share, review, and don't forget to subscribe by clicking that subscribe button below. If you have any case recommendations, send them my way. I would love to hear them. And don't forget to follow me on social at underscore Annie Elise. So let's get into the case. Hey guys, welcome back. Today we're going to be talking about a case that actually is really important to me that I just recently discovered, which I don't know how I missed it on my radar, but in case you missed it as well, we're going to now be talking about it. It actually is also covered in a new documentary that was just released on Showtime called Outcry, and it is the case of Greg Kelly. Now, Greg was an 18-year-old superstar football player at his high school. He lived in Texas, and I mean, this community and this school, it was straight out of that movie and the TV show Friday Night Lights. Tight-knit community, football was everything. It was like a religion to them. The entire community would go to the games. The, the football players were looked at as, you know, celebrities. And he was, at a very young age, a sophomore actually, he was brought on to the team and they said, this guy is going to go all the way. He is so extremely talented. He is so fast, like it is just nuts. And on top of that, he was just an all around really good guy kind heart, sweet family. He had a long-term girlfriend who he had met at a very young age too. Good morals, just a very stand-up guy. Worked hard, was always in the gym, worked hard at football, got good grades. I mean, just a great guy. This whole story really begins back in 2012, 2013, like right around that time period. And he was in high school at the time, like I was mentioning. And unfortunately at the time, both of his parents were undergoing some pretty tough health concerns. His dad had had a stroke, his mom was recovering from a brain tumor, and he had quite a bit on his plate. And unfortunately, both parents weren't there to really take care of them in the capacity that they wanted. So he ended up having an offer extended to him by his best friend, Jonathan's mom, to move in with their family. And she was a big time booster in the program for the football team at the school and she was really just you know Greg come in I'll take care of you I'll take you under my wing like you're part of our family too she knew how talented he was as well he had spoke out oftentimes about how once he makes it pro she'll be his agent and she really just wanted to make sure that he had a rock solid home life that he was able to continue practicing and playing football and really get to whatever level he wanted to get to without having these restrictions based on what was going on in his personal life Greg and Jonathan were more than just best friends on the surface, I mean, they looked identical. I know we always hear that sometimes pets start to look like their owner, or your best friend starts to look like you, and you really take on each other's mannerisms and facial expressions, but these two guys literally look like they were cut from the same cloth and like they could be twins. I mean, it is pretty bizarre. Personally, when I first started even watching the documentary, and they started introducing Jonathan, I looked at them and I was like, wait, which one's which? They look the exact same. I was confused. And especially as young boys going through football together, they're in the uniform, they have the same haircut. I mean, they looked identical. So they were close in appearance and close in friendship. And so his mother, Rosa, agreed to it and was really supportive. And everything was apparently, at the seams of it, very, very great. And you wouldn't have ever expected a problem to occur. But like we know, when you least expect it, that's when it hits you the hardest. Greg's best friend, Jonathan's mom, Shama, 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 sorry, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that 100% correctly, but she ran an in-home daycare at the house. So again, a beautiful house in the suburbs of Texas. She had an in-home daycare business and kids all was in and out of the house. And she was just a very sweet, loving woman. However, from the outside, what appeared to be an innocent, you know, happy daycare life and a big close family and she's really tight knit and she's taking care of her son's best friend just completely blew apart because in 2013, Greg was accused of sexually assaulting one of the four-year-old boys who was at that daycare. And this news rocked the community because as I mentioned, they were a very tight-knit community. He was the star football player. He had this amazing girlfriend who he had been with for years. I mean, he lived with one of the booster parents. They, like there was just no way people could wrap their minds around it. They were in shock and Truthfully, they ended up becoming pretty crazy about it and the whole community went into uproar. On August 12, 2013, police came to the high school, to Leander High School, and arrested Greg and charged him with sexual assault of a child. 
And as I mentioned, Shama, who was Jonathan's mother and Jonathan was Greg's best friend, she supported Greg through and through, through everything. And even though this alleged incident took place in her home at her business with the daycare, she continued to stand by Greg. So much so that she said, I'm going to get you a lawyer. I know somebody. We stand behind you. We're going to fight this. You will win. We're going to take care of it. Don't even worry about a thing. And as they start putting the pieces together, saying, you know, we're going to fight this. This is just one allegation. We can prove that it wasn't you. A second boy comes forward. And he also names Greg as somebody who molested him. Greg is, of course, arrested. And we then now wait for the trial to begin. On July 8th, 2014, almost a year later, the trial begins. And there's virtually no physical evidence, not any physical evidence. It's just the statements from these two four-year-old boys, which of course we know outcry witnesses, those statements do weigh pretty heavily. However, with no physical evidence, the jury really has to reach their verdict and make their decision based on the testimony of these two young boys. And that is it because there is nothing else involved in the case as far as evidence goes. And sure enough, one of those young boys ends up retracting his statement. However, even though now that one victim has recanted and they only have the testimony of this one child, still the prosecution is going after Greg, making their case. And just a few days later on July 16th, 2014, he is convicted and charged with two counts of super aggravated child assault. And a super aggravated assault charge comes with a pretty hefty sentence. It can be anywhere from 25 years to life with zero possibility of parole because of the super aggravated charge attached to it. Right before the sentencing hearing, Greg is given literally just a few moments with his family and they bring an offer to the table saying, we will allow you, before you get sentenced officially, we will allow you to agree to 25 years. However, that means if you accept that deal and only serve the 25 years, that you are waiving your right to an appeal in the future. And he had a million things going on through his mind. So he confides in his brother saying, you know, tell me, what do I do? What do I do? And ultimately he agrees and says, okay, I will accept that 25 years. I know I can't ever get an appeal and I can't apply for an appeal, but that's better than life without parole. And so he is sentenced to 25 years without parole and without the option to ever file for an appeal. Not only when the conviction news hit, but when the sentencing news hit, it rocked the community and there was a huge outcry from the community because he was still getting all of the support from his coaches, his friends, his girlfriend who never broke up with him. She stood faithfully by his side. Her parents even stood by his side. I mean, everybody said, this cannot be true. This is not the person we know. There is just no possible way. And the community was up in arms saying, there needs to be justice for Greg. This isn't right. This isn't fair. What's going on? But unfortunately, at that point, he was officially convicted. He had already been now been sentenced and he had no longer any sort of option in the future of what of trying to get an appeal because he waived that right when he accepted that 25 year sentence. Just a few short weeks later, his attorney files a motion for a retrial, which the judge quickly denies and shuts down. For the next two years, the team works on overturning his conviction because although he waived that right to appeal, they're now trying to overturn it and saying, you know, citing that he didn't have proper representation, that all evidence wasn't introduced. They were trying to do anything to overturn this conviction now because still they believe in their heart of hearts he is innocent and that justice wasn't served. On February 11th, 2016, the appeals court affirms the conviction and they are saying after two years of trying to overturn it, no, the conviction holds up and I'm sorry, that is what it is. The defense team says, we have new evidence that shows that there is no way that it could have been Greg because we have evidence he wasn't even at the daycare when they said this alleged incident took place. He had actually moved out of that home a month prior to when this alleged incident took place. Like we have enough evidence here. We need to at least, whether it's an appeal or go to a retrial or overturn, we need to do something here because not all of this information was presented at the first trial. On May 25th, 2017, a few years later now at this point, point, authorities reopen the case and they identify a new suspect in the case. And that suspect is none other than Greg's best friend, Jonathan. And remember, Jonathan's mom is the one who operated that in-home daycare and the booster and the one who got the attorney for Greg and really took him under his wing. And then this was really just a bombshell because everybody was like, what are you talking about? Jonathan is... Shama's son, he lives at that house. He was Greg's best friend. What do you mean? Like this rocked the community. However, at the time, Jonathan was actually in custody on a probation violation. And as things started to unravel, it showed that he had a pretty checkered past with over 16 different arrests. And that's when people really started talking about how could this be possible? What role could Jonathan have really played? And the story goes, which I know we've all heard this story before, that 
this mother who took Greg under her wing, although it was Jonathan's best friend, he started to harbor quite a bit of resentment towards Greg because he wasn't nearly as talented as Greg when it came to football. And people vocalized that in a big way. His mother even vocalized that saying that when she was going to be Greg's agent, her son Jonathan was never going to go pro. That's why she would represent him. And so he wanted his life. He had the happy girlfriend. He had the happy life. He had the pro football career. I mean, he had everything that Jonathan wanted. And he really started to resent him, not only because of that, because he had the life he wished he had, but because he even saw his own mother start to favor Greg over him. So now Greg's team is saying, you know, we have not only this new evidence that shows Greg was never even the house, but we also have a new suspect. So they went and filed the form of a writ because that is what you can really bring to the court to have a new hearing to say, look, that he was unlawfully jailed, there's a new evidence, he was poorly represented because this new evidence, even though it was documented in the file, was never brought up by his defense attorney, so he had poor representation. What's going on here? Like, well, let's actually get into court, let's have another hearing, and then let's go from there with the appeal. And this is really the only avenue they could have taken to get that appeal because remember, Greg waived his right to appeal when he accepted that 25 year sentence. As his new defense team is gathering all of this evidence, they discover so much more evidence that works in his favor. They discover that one of the little boys who had first made that accusation, when he was describing the room that this alleged incident took place in, at first while well, he said Greg's room, then he started describing it and he says, the coach's room, the one with all the trophies, the room with the couch, which that room he was describing was Jonathan's room. They also discover that his former defense attorney, the one that Shama had brought in saying, this is my friend, where I'm going to get you an attorney, we're going to take care of you. She had already worked with the family 10 years ago in the past, and one of the charges she had worked with them with was lewdness with a child. So there was clearly a huge conflict of interest because had she even realized during the entire investigation process that Jonathan was ever a suspect while she's defending Greg, would she have brought that up if she had close ties with the family and had represented the family before? She kept that information to herself, which was another reason why his new defense team had said, clearly she did not have his best interest in her and there was something shady going on here. They also discover a plethora of naked images on Jonathan's phone and computer, and some images are considered to be child pornography. And as all of this is taking place, they also identify a new victim who calls Jonathan out as raping her when she was 15 years old and he was 18 years old. In 2015, they were at a frat party in San Marcos, and he was 18 at the time, she was 15 at the time, and he drugged her and raped her. And this was within months of Greg formally, officially being convicted of those charges. So. That begs the question, did he escalate to full rape because now he knew he got away with it? We've seen in other cases so often that when they get away with it or they believe they've gotten away with it, that is when they escalate. And they either go from breaking and entering to rape or rape to murder, and they really are jumping ahead of what they had previously gotten away with. So was this an indication of that? And if this suspect, if Jonathan had been named a suspect prior to this taking place, this young woman would never have even been raped to begin with. He wouldn't have had that opportunity. So there is just all sorts of injustice happening now at this point. In an affidavit that was later released, a Texas Ranger actually states that he spoke to several witnesses who say Jonathan had sexually assaulted women in four different counties. Finally, after all this information is presented, a judge sets a hearing for August 3rd, 2017, which would determine if Greg's going to be released out of prison on bond as they await a new, hopefully, trial or appeal or some sort of overturned conviction. On May 31st, 2017, Greg sits down for his very first in-person interview, and he really just starts talking about what the last three years have meant behind bars, how if it really is in fact Jonathan who is responsible, how that level of betrayal is so hurtful because that was his best friend. and as his best friend, not only could he do that to a young boy, but also how could you allow your best friend to just go into prison for something you committed and continue to live your life while they're behind bars? And again, that's really where this whole resentment feel comes into play. As Greg and the team are waiting on this hearing to begin, the Texas Ranger releases affidavits of search warrants of Greg's computer and his cell phone. And it's such poor timing because while he was standing on their side at one point, now he's really just kind of trying to attack Greg's character because these search warrants release a ton of information where he basically paints him as a sexual deviant, that he's a liar, that he had issues with heightened sexuality, and so it does indicate that he's guilty because what those search warrants and what that affidavit stated was that they discovered in his browser history on his phone and his computer that he visited several pornography websites. He was also a member of a website called Adult Friend Finder where you basically meet up with people to have sex and it's very casual. And so they really tried to paint him as this heightened sexual 
man who was escalating and he really had the means and the desire to do these things where, hello, we know every teenage boy probably looks at porn sites. I mean, give me a break. That's no surprise there. But like, they're going through puberty. They're in high school. Like, give me a break. However, he then denies. He's like, adult friend finder. I've never even heard of that website. What are you talking about? And there were four different usernames listed on that affidavit. It was a play on his name in four different ways. It was, you know, Greg Kelly 2 or Greg Kelly this, like four different ones. And he's like, I've never made these accounts. And when his defense team reached out to this website and said, can you validate these accounts? They said they didn't even have any record of those accounts being made. So two things could be happening. Either one, the Texas Ranger and what he listed on that affidavit is complete BS and it's not real and he was trying to really strengthen their argument against him. Or maybe it was Jonathan who created these false accounts as Greg, pretending to be Greg because we know he wanted his life and idolized him so much. And maybe he did those things because he was trying to meet up with people because we know he's already now at this point been accused of rape. He's been named a suspect in this case. So it seems more likely that maybe a scenario like that is what really was taking place. We still haven't arrived to the hearing and on June 8th, 2017, another affidavit is released. And this one states that a child who knew both Jonathan and Greg had trouble telling them apart because as we mentioned in the very beginning of this video, they looked so similar. So now the defense is suggesting too that this little boy who made this story of being abused, although he probably isn't lying and making up the story of being abused, easily could have misspoke and identified the wrong person. And it could have been mistaken identity because we know Jonathan and Greg look so similar. They lived in the same house. Finally, in August, 2017, the writ hearing begins. And on day two of the hearing, the Texas Ranger states there has been a third suspect named in this case. Now you have three suspects, which this was never brought up at the first trial. You have Greg, you have Jonathan, and now you have this third mysterious suspect who you're not naming because you want to keep the integrity of the investigation. But why wasn't any of this evidence brought up during the first trial? This was shocking to everybody. And it was really a bombshell that was dropped during this hearing because now not only was that Texas Ranger saying there is a third suspect, but he also admitted on the stand that Jonathan had child pornography on his phone, that he had admitted to others that he's the one who abused the boy, and it was just an unloaded release of information where people were like, what is going on? Like, where was this information? How did this slip through the cracks? It's now been three years and Greg has been in prison and the, all of this information that's being released could have easily brought up reasonable doubt and created that doubt to where he wouldn't have been convicted or maybe at least not even on the supercharged defense, but like, how did this slip and not get brought up sooner? It is so sketchy and shady, and it makes you wonder what really is going on with the justice system. August 27th, 2017, three years after being accused of molesting a four-year-old child, Greg is released on bond, and we're waiting to see, can we get this overturned? A few months later, on Monday, December 18th, 2017, a judge officially recommends that Greg's conviction should be overturned and that they have provided enough evidence to deem him as innocent. And she says, had the jury been presented all of this evidence in the first trial, there is no way that they could have proved guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. Greg was in Cabo with his girlfriend when he received the news and heard of the judge's recommendation. And they were, of course, ecstatic. And the very next day, he proposes to his longtime girlfriend. And while this decision is great, it is not the final chapter. We know that he's out on bond. We know now that she has recommended that the conviction be overturned. But it is not the final chapter because Greg still now needs to face the court of appeal to see if that conviction will be overturned or if he is going to have to go back and return to prison to finish out his 25-year sentence. And for the next two years, Greg waits on pins and needles, checking every single Wednesday at 9 a.m. to see is his appeal going to hold up and is his conviction going to be overturned or is he going to be sent back to prison. He had to check every single week and he couldn't really move forward with his life because he was in this constant limbo. He didn't know, am I going to be free? Am I going to be exonerated? Am I going to go back to prison? How do I even move forward? And it was just years of being in this constant state of legal limbo, waiting to hear what the news would be. I can't even imagine what that anticipation and gut-wrenching feeling must have felt like because we've all been in situations before, obviously, hopefully not as severe as this, but where we're anticipating a horrible exam we have to take or the first day of school or you're getting fired from a job, just that feeling where it's not feeling great and sitting right in your stomach and having to go through that for years and not know what your fate is going to be and check every single Wednesday at 9 a.m. refreshing a website to say, here's what your fate is and what your life is going to look like. I mean, that feeling alone must have been unreal. But 
Greg continued to stay positive. He was working out. He was still training. He was trying to figure out how can I get back on the football field. He was moving forward with his life with his girlfriend, now fiance. I mean, he wasn't letting it get him down, yet he was still handcuffed in a way because he couldn't make any sort of concrete future plans, not knowing what his future really would look like. Years go by and Greg and his defense attorney are like, why is this taking so long? Is something up? Is something on behind the scenes going on to where they're trying to put a standstill on this or they're trying to bring more evidence like why isn't this happening why is it taking so long and it just continued to go on for years and finally two years after Greg was released on bond and six years after he was convicted of sexually assaulting that child his conviction is overturned and he is able to move forward and move on with his life the state's highest criminal court overturned his conviction and deemed him as exonerated Finally, the nightmare is over. Finally, he can move forward with his life. He can pursue football again. He can get married. He can live the life that he should have been living since he was 18 years old and he was wrongfully accused and wrongfully convicted. Meanwhile, in that alleged rape case with Jonathan, he did plead guilty to unlawful restraint and drug charges not to the rape itself, but he was given four years and the victim said, that's enough as long as I've named my accuser, people know who he is, they know what he's done, as long as he serves some sort of punishment and I've named him and I identified him, that's good enough for me, I wish it was more and I wish it had never happened, but at least he is being held partially responsible. Going back to the case of the four-year-old boy who was sexually assaulted, nobody else aside from Greg has been charged in that case and we don't know if anybody ever will. Hopefully they do get enough evidence to charge Jonathan or whoever is responsible with this crime. However, as of now, nobody else has been charged, which I can't even imagine for that family, that boy, those parents, what kind of turmoil that must be. Because what a roller coaster the last six years have been at this point. You're going through the first trial, the retrials, the new suspects, all of these things, and you still want justice for your child. And as a mom, I know what that would feel like. I would like, well, Luckily, I don't know what that situation feels like, but I can imagine what it would feel like to just want to make sure that their innocence is protected and that you are holding whoever is responsible accountable. So, so it kills me that they still haven't received justice for that and that this poor boy hasn't received his justice and hopefully that will come soon. So now Greg is a free man. His conviction was overturned. He is free to move on with his life. And seven months ago, January 19th, 2020, he and his longtime girlfriend got married and they are living a very happy life together, excited for the future trying to put this entire nightmare behind them and move forward, but while still bringing awareness, bettering the justice system, and I mean really just trying to get whatever positive things you can squeeze out of such a horrible situation, that is what they're actively trying to do. So we are so happy for them and wish them a happy marriage, a very happy life, and hopefully no more hiccups along the road, and hopefully this is it, you've dealt with it, and you it is just smooth sailing from here. Thanks for listening to this case with me, you guys. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe to my channel. And if you're listening to the podcast version of this, please go ahead and read it. Um, also, exciting news, we finally have merch up. So the link is in the description box below if you want some true crime merch. And don't forget to like, share, comment, rate, review. Um, I love hearing from you guys and love hearing your feedback. And until the next case, bye guys.